Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George, and today we're going to talk about revitalizing religion through transcending the illusion of free will. Okay, before we do that, I just want to go briefly through what we generally mean when we say that we have a free will and, you know, a bit of why that's impossible, and then just <coughs> why this matters in general. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, generally, the belief in free will is that we would be ch free to choose whatever we would want to think, feel, do, say, completely on our own, of our own accord, without any kind of influence from any factor that we would not have control of. Now, naturally, um, when you consider that we all have an unconscious where <coughs> all of our thoughts and our words and our concepts and memories are stored, and the unconscious is also the part of our brain where the processing of information is, of all that, you know, accessing the data of the memories, and then coming up with a conclusion or a decision. When you understand it from that perspective, you know, it's easy to understand how free will must be an illusion because, you know, by definition, the unconscious is something we're not aware of. Okay. So, and the reason this is so important is that, I mean, our, our very civilization is founded on this illusion, this, this idea that, you know, that we're free and it just, it creates so many problems. It's like we, we blame ourselves and each other for things that, that we're not responsible for, that, you know, you know, we do what, what nature, God, whatever, compels us to do. And so <clears throat> the idea, the prediction, the hope is that to the extent that we understand that um, free will is an illusion and our wills are really causal, we can create a much more intelligent, compassionate, and understanding world based on that more accurate understanding of the nature of our, you know, human will. Okay, so here's the, so today we're going to be talking about like, see, with religion, um, at least in America, probably throughout the world, as each decade goes by, there, there are less and less people that gravitate to it, that, um, that have it as a part of their everyday life. <coughs> Excuse me. And, you know, that's, that's a bit unfortunate because, like, you know, while some religions will continue to um, propound certain beliefs that are outdated, harmful in some cases, divisive, uh, there is one aspect of religion that's actually very, very um, beneficial to society, beneficial to, to individuals. And that's the idea that, like, you know, we, this suburbs, metropolitan areas, cities, it, it's a relatively new kind of um, aspect of civilization. Before that, you know, it was more like small towns and, you know, before that, tribal communities, you know, just like small groups where there was like a, um, a set community that, you know, one could see the same people each day and relate to them. You know, there was, there was a sense of community. And as our civilization evolved from the small towns to the suburbs and cities, we, we lost a great part of that. I mean, you know, television and the media does help to try to, you know, bring us together, but but churches and synagogues and other religious institutions have traditionally um, done a wonderful job of creating communities. Um, so, so the idea, it's like, to that extent, it's unfortunate that um, the religion is waning as, as it has been over the last however many decades, um, certainly since the 40s and 50s. And the, so, you know, we, we, can try to, we can try to figure out, well, why is it that, um, and just one, one other th um, point before I go into this, um, the problem is, is pretty dire for many congregations. I mean, now, like, for example, the cost of maintaining their property has become so burdensome that many congregations are now forced to share a property with one or two other congregations. I mean, which that, that's kind of a nice idea in a sense, but you know, the, the, the salient point is that, you know, 
because of the lack of members, um, these religions, and these institutions are threatened, and, and the communities that um, that they create are threatened. Okay, so yeah, there there may be, you know, there there are various reasons why so many people have, you know, moved away from religion, and you know, I can perhaps guess about some of them, like. In, in Christianity, a bit less so in Judaism, there's this idea that like, well, if you do certain things wrong, you're going to be like punished for the rest of eternity, you know, uh, tortured for the rest of eternity, whatever, you know, some, and, you know, I think as we, um, as we evolve as a species, you know, as we become more intelligent and, and you know, more considerate of our world, we kind of like, think to ourselves, wait a minute, you know, how, how would an all-loving God do that? Or, or, or why would, you know, if, if we're here on earth for, you know, tops 80, 100 years, how could one be condemned for an eternity, trillions, zillions of years, for an act done in a day, for example, or whatever? So, so that may be one reason. Another reason may be that um, sometimes churches... Um, are, are seen as hypocritical in, in, a, in a sense like sometimes they will profess to champion the rights of the poor, but then like when it comes to politics, many churches, religious institutions will actually um, support legislation that, that's against the best interests of the poor. So that, that may be, you know, and, and it's not just about the poor, it's about like, you know, women's rights, gay rights, um, various other kinds of um, um, you know, issues that, that, that relate to everyone. Um, another, another reason why I think um, churches and synagogues are losing people is that mythology, the mythology just doesn't seem to work anymore. It doesn't, it, it, it's actually counterproductive in a certain sense. For example, take the, the creation story of Adam and Eve. I mean, um, the standard account is that um, Eve was formed from the rib of, of Adam, the first man. And one could see how that might be a bit derogatory to women, you know, in a sense that, um, that you know, they weren't created, you know, on an equal basis, whatever. And um, so, and, and the last thing is that I think that very little relatively in religion has changed over the last 2,000 years. And so, like, you know, so much of it doesn't make sense to people that, um, that you know, that may account in part for why people have, have left the communities, um, the religious um, congregations. Okay, so the, the prediction, the hope, is that a major change in ideology and in, in theology in what churches and synagogues teach might actually help to bring people back to the flock, back to, to a religious community that's, you know, based on, on doing good, you know, on, on being good, improving the world, and, you know, just helping one another and all, because that's to a great extent what religion is about. Okay, so um, now let's let's just like before, kind of like going through how the idea that that we don't have a free will can help churches to bring people back. I just want to go briefly through. Um, through how, you know, what, what this idea of free will means in religion, because like, you know, generally most people take it to be just a premise of, of especially Christianity that's like, well, yeah, God granted us a free will, but when you look at the scripture, you'll, you'll, you'll find that that's not, you know, the issue is far from clear in the Bible. Um, for example, the first... The first person to really um, consider this, um, to question it actually, was actually um, St. Paul in, in a letter to, Ro um, to Romans, in his letter to the Romans, which is dated about 58 AD, he writes the following. It's, it's in Romans 7.15. I don't understand myself at all, for I really want to do what is right, but I can't. I do what I don't want to, what I hate. So here, Paul is like explaining, wait a minute, you know, if I had a free will, if I, if I could do my will, exercise my will, I would be good all the time. You know, I would, be, I would do the good that I want, and I wouldn't do 
the the bad that I that I didn't want to do. You know, so so Paul had this this understanding, and then this again, this is 58 A.D. Um, what many people don't realize is like the term free will actually is not in the Bible. Um, it's not until about 380, 390 A.D. that Saint Augustine began to grapple with the question. He um, he was. It, and it was in relation to, to God's qualities. The idea is that like he was trying to grapple with evil and justice. And he was trying to like, say, well, if God is all good, how could there be evil in the world? And so he wrote a book. Um, it's called De Libro Arbitrero. And it's translated as On Free Will. And he actually coined the term free will, you know, 390 AD. And... Um, and in it he writes, uh, evil deeds are punished by the justice of God. They would not be punished justly if they had not been performed voluntarily. Now, you know, you can kind of like see a certain logic in that, in that statement. But, you know, unfortunately, it just like, you know, it, it doesn't stand up to the test, you know, for example, to this test of, of our having an un unconscious, to the test of every decision we, making, we make having a cause. You know, it just doesn't stand up to reason. It doesn't stand up to science. It's kind of like saying, well, you know, the world should be just, completely just, completely, should completely make sense, and... Um, and so a certain thing must be a certain way. You know, we must um, have a free will for it to, to make a certain kind of sense. So, but, but actually this is really based on a misunderstanding or at least one interpretation of God. Because an, um, one conception of God is that God is omni, um, Ooh, um, all good. Uh, I, I can't think. Of what is? It. I don't know. He's all good. Um, um, that he, 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 you know, he can't but do good, and um, and so. But the reality is, like you know, God Himself. I think in Isaiah, Isaiah He says, um, you know, I create good, I create evil. Okay. So so like so that you know, from that understanding, um, you could see how. St. Augustine's, you know, premise upon which he based the need for free will is actually false, you know, at least according to that interpretation, that, 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 um, that line in Isaiah. All right, so, so the idea is um, the concept, the term, the idea of free will is not central to, um, to the Bible. You know, again, it's something that... Um, that's not even mentioned, that it's alluded to just rel very, very infrequently, actually. And so, um, so it, it's something that, that I think many congregation, churches, synagogues could very realistically, um, authoritatively look at and, um, and reach their own conclusion. You know, I think very few congregations um, now believe, well, at least, um, I'm not sure if it's a majority, but I, a lot of congregations now understand that um, the world, the planet, whatever, was not created 6,000 years ago, as the, as the Bible would have us believe. You know, w most congregations accept the standard understanding that the universe is, as far as we know, 13.7 billion years old. So it's not, it's not uncommon for congregations, churches, denominations, um, to, to kind of like look at the world from the clearer eyes of, of um, modern science and, and what we know now and just amend or, or change certain beliefs that, um, that seemed reasonable back when they were created before we knew what we know now but no longer seem um, justifiable. All right, so... <laughs> What would it mean? What it would it mean? Um, let's say you know. Let's say churches began to like promote this idea that. I mean, and here's how they'd have to do it. They'd, they'd have to say, "Listen, all right. The truth is, 
we do not have free wills. That free will is an illusion, but at the same time they're going to be saying, which very rightly, but that doesn't give us license to do as we please. In other words, um, that doesn't, just because we're not the authors of our, of our um, acts, of our thoughts, decisions, doesn't mean that we can just shirk all responsibility. Um, because what we do have has consequences. And the other thing is like, you know, again, we have to maintain a certain kind of order and, and um, civilization, you know, just a certain kind of um, shared community. So, so the, you know, that's, that's the way it would be presented. But see then, a part, um, at the same time, it would be presented in the sense that, fine, all right, um, we don't have a free will. We should kind of like, nonetheless, act good, act, act responsibly. But when we're judging ourselves and when we're judging other people, because like, you know, we all know, religions know that um, religions kind of like hold up the idea that, that, that man was born sinful, that human beings were, you know, born to sin. And like sin literally means missing the mark, making mistakes. We all make mistakes. So, within the context of making mistakes, there is much more rationale now for not even having to forgive. Because, you know, religion very rightly teaches that because we're all flawed in various ways, it's wise to f forgive one another and ourselves for the invariable mistakes we'll make. But to the extent that we understand that we are not the authors of our thoughts, that, you know, the, the universe is causal. You can you say that we can, that, I mean, what, what the churches and synagogues could say is that we're instruments of God. You know, that would certainly fit within their theology. But because of that, because we're not the authors of what we do, that provides every rationale for us to be understanding toward each other, compassionate, to hold each other and ourselves innocent. That's the key. You know, so if we're innocent, if, if what we do isn't really up to us, we're just like basically manifesting and expressing um, the will of God or fate, then, um, then when we do wrong, you know, again, there's, there's no need to forgive because, it, you know, I mean, we might want to forgive the universe or God for, for causing us to do wrong. That's a, that's a question to be explored. But there's no longer any justification or rationale for blaming ourselves or others, for, um, for wanting us to be punished and all. Okay, um, this, this kind of perspective, you know, would, would be epical. You know, um, it would revitalize religion like nothing um, has before. I mean, like, who knows? I mean, you know, I guess um, in Christianity, well, you know, when Jesus came around 2,000 years ago, that was like a major change from the very legalistic um, tradition of the, of the Jews, you know, the, the Pharisees. Um, you know, Christianity was supposed to be more about, um, you know, acts, acts of compassion, acts of mercy and all. But um, since then, yeah, um, there, you know, I mean, I guess, um, you know, you have um, Muhammad with Islam and you have other religions, you know, between that time and now that have had their contributions. But certainly within the Judeo-Christian context, you know, nothing majorly has happened over the last 2,000 years. And this, this would represent that sea change that I think... Um, people need, people want, you know. People have moved away from religion because it doesn't make sense to their lives anymore. Um, and it's unfortunate because, you know, much of religion is very ennobling. It, it, it helps people to understand the difference between right and wrong. I mean, much of it is very good, very useful. And, and again, um, the community that religion fosters, that religion enables, you know, communities like, you know, churches, synagogues, um, congregations throughout, you know, the land in every town. I mean, that's an invaluable service to humanity. And, and it's, you know, it's a shame that it's dwindling. It's a shame that it's um, kind of like being reduced because of the, the, um, the ideas that are presented by these congregations are so outdated that, that you know, that, um, people don't find them relevant. So, um, so.
so yeah, um, I, I believe that um, considering that the notion of free will is not central to any biblical teaching, that it was just, you know, it was St. Augustine's answer to his conception that God, you know, can't be blamed for anything, which is interesting. I got to like, all right, when um, in religion, it's very funny, in religion when, when, um, when something happens, when we do something that's really good, you know, we achieve something, whatever, you know, we're taught to be modest, to be humble, to thank God. You know, we're taught that, you know, hey, we could not have done it without God's help, without God's allowing us to do it. You know, we praise God for, for the good that we do. We feel that gratitude. But, you know, interestingly enough, when it comes to our doing wrong, you know, we're like, we're, we're taught, religions teach us, well, it, you know, you can't blame God. It's got to be your fault. <laughs> and so, like, you see how there's, like, that um, inconsistent logic there. Um, but, but that's the idea, you know, that, um, that um, religions teach us to, um, to blame ourselves and each other now. And, you know, as a result, I think, you know, I mean, it's not just religion, it's the, the legal system, it's the educational system. Our whole civilization is based on this myth, this illusion of free will. And so, yeah, so to abandon that, to abandon that would be like just a complete paradigm shift in, in what the churches teach, if, in what synagogues teach, mosques, I guess, because, you know, this could be like a, a global movement, perhaps. But... Um, that's the key. The key is that um, if it no longer makes sense to believe that human beings have a free will, and if the belief in free will leads to so much unnecessary conflict, aggression, um, and if overcoming this belief, if adopting the new belief of a causal will, that we're basically instruments of God, um, if that would help revitalize the church, if that would help bring people back to congregations so that we could restore that sense of community that's lost, I think that'd be a wonderful thing. And, um, and I, think, I think challenging the, uh, the notion of free will is such, a, um, such an essential challenge to the beliefs we, we've held for, you know, for as long as we can remember that I don't think it, um, it could not but attract a huge amount of attention among congregations, among people who have left churches and synagogues and then would like find reasons to come back if, for no other reason but to explore this, this brand new um, perspective on reality, you know, to, to see how, um, how their lives can change, you know, individually by not blaming the people in their lives for what they do wrong and not feeling the pain of guilt for what we do wrong. And, and again, you know, I've done shows on this. This certainly does not mean that we abandon morality because, like, you know, we're actually um, hardwired to, to seek what we believe is good. And, and we're hardwired to, um, to seek pleasure, to avoid pain. So, we're, you know, we're not going to abandon the morality. But for us to have that kind of understanding that... Um, we no longer have to blame people. And when we don't blame people for what they do wrong, we feel closer to them. When we don't blame ourselves for what we do wrong, um, we feel better about ourselves. And self-esteem is one of the four components that's uh, most closely correlated with, with happiness. So, you know, one could easily see the benefit of that. Okay, so, um, so the idea is, yes, that... Um, this, this notion of free will, considering its impossibility, considering how science, logic, experience, you know, um, all so, so completely refute it, I think, it, I think it's, a, it's an idea that's ripe for, um, for um, overcoming, for transcending. And, and I think the religious institutions would be the, the proper vehicle, or, or one proper vehicle, because certainly this is an educational um, topic as well. But um, to the extent that religious in institutions would, um, 
would recognize this, would recognize that one could overcome the illusion of free will and still have, um, still promote morality, still promote the existence of God and all that, then, um, then I think we could create a, a new world through, through this understanding. I think the religions could, you know. Um, it's, we, you know, our world has a lot of problems. Climate change, the, the global economic crisis, um, overpopulation and all that. There's a lot going on and we need new answers. The, the answers that um, are coming out of politics now, that have come out of religion for, um, for you know, centuries now, they're just not suited to, to um, fit the reality we, we face now. And, you know, for example, with, with climate change, with, with things that are going wrong, um, if, if the world becomes very challenging in various ways, the last thing we want to do is just be at odds at each other, just, you know, not doing what we need to do because we're so busy blaming ourselves and each other for, for what went wrong. So, okay, so that's, that's the idea. I hope, I hope that, um, that people in religion, you know, um, ministers, rabbis, pastors, the different kinds of um, clerics, you know, throughout the various denominations, various religions will, will understand the, um, the importance of this issue and, and understand how it really can bring back um, people to, to their congregation. All right, well, I think that's all for, t for today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the show. Um, I'm going to continue exploring. Um, you know, this has been more about how we can, like, implement the, um, the nature of our causal will into society. I'm going to keep, though, explaining why we don't have a free will, because that's absolutely essential to, um, to this idea and to just improving the world through a better understanding of our ca causal will. So anyway, I hope you're having a great day, and I guess I will see you on, on the next episode. Thanks.